Okay, my next uh, session I'm calling Alien Contact? Question mark. We've looked at the history of UFOs, ancient history, recent history, some of the incredible sightings that have been very well documented in recent uh, years, and we've looked at the nature of UFOs and the nature of aliens. Indeed, since I started doing this research and uh, since I started doing talks on this material, I've had many, many, many people that have come to me and have told me about their own encounters with what they were told and what they believed were aliens. I've had many people that have told me that they encountered these entities. Most of these people told me that before they got saved, before they were Christians, that they had had exposure. They were involved in some sort of occultic activity and had exposure with entities that behaved in the ways we've discussed. Not just the craft themselves, but the entities. Um, materializing and dematerializing, passing through walls, changing shape, sending telepathic messages, etc. All supernatural phenomena associated with entities which have identified themselves or made it known that they were um, wanted to be believed that they were aliens. What we're going to talk about this afternoon is some of the types of contact that people have had, the nature of contact, and the nature of the message that people have been given by these entities variously described as aliens. There are many different types of contact that have been reported with aliens. Many different types of alien encounters. I guess that's an appropriate word. One of the most common types that we read about today in the literature of the New Age is channeling. Channeling is a process whereby a person opens themselves up, opens up their mind in a state of altered consciousness and allows an entity, a supernatural entity, literally to enter and to speak through them. I have a shelf at home that... Uh, I dare not let my children touch, that is filled with books. Many of these books are books that were channeled directly. People uh, like Barbara Marciniak and others will be looking at some of the messages, claim that they are able to work themselves up into an altered state of consciousness. The alien entities enter in some non-physical way, and then they write down and record, literally, the messages that have been given by these alien entities. In some cases, the people obviously look like they're in a state of a trance and their voice may change. But the point is, is that's one of the main contact methods in the 20th century. It's been going on for decades. And it's identical to what would be referred to as being a medium or mediumship, which occurred, you know, has been occurring for centuries and centuries. Of course, the second form of contact is face-to-face. -face, and I indeed have spoken with and have contacted many people who... Uh, claim to have had face-to-face -face contact with uh, alien entities. A third type is what is called atom automatic writing. Automatic writing is a process whereby you allow yourself to go into an altered state of consciousness. The alien entity then takes over your motor apparatus of your body and unconsciously you begin to write the message that they want you to write. And of course, abductions. Abductions have been going on in this century since 1957 when a gentleman by the name of Antonio Boas Villas in uh, South America stated that he was abducted by uh, aliens and had a uh, sexual encounter with what he described was the most beautiful humanoid alien entity he'd, or humanoid entity he'd ever seen in his life. That was 1957. We're going to look extensively at the abduction phenomenon today. According to some studies, between 1 and 3% of the American population has answered surveys in, uh, in studies in a way which indicates that they may have had an abduction experience. John Mack, MD from Harvard University, um, David Jacobs, who wrote the book Secret Life, and Bud Hopkins, all have sort of gotten a feel for the frequency of alleged abduction, and it's quite extensive. I mean, 1% of the population of the United States of America, that would be 2.6 million people. But indeed, those are the kinds of numbers that they claim that they've come up with. 
And a final type of contact is called walk-ins. A walk-in, you can imagine, is a type of contact where you allow yourself to develop an altered state of consciousness, allow your mind to be blank, and a supposed alien entity is who is so highly evolved, they tell us, that they have shed the encumberments of flesh and have evolved into a purely spiritual entity simply walks in and takes over the house, okay, your body, and then you become a walk-in. So you're, in effect, hardware of a human being, and the software is now an alien, and that's called a walk-in. Pretty scary, huh? If there's any of you here that have done that, I do not want to talk to you after this session. <laughs> One of the most prominent researchers in the abduction field is Dr. John Mack. Dr. John Mack is the former chief of psychiatry at Harvard University School of Medicine. He's the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for writing in the 1970s, and he's the author of author or co-author of 150 peer-reviewed scientific papers. John Mack began having people referred to him in the late 80s by local psychiatrists who believed that they had been abducted. And John Mack was skeptical. And so what he did as a psychiatrist, he began examining these people using the typical methods of examination that a psychiatrist would use to assess the psychological stability of these people. He studied personally before 1994 over 100 cases of people using extensive diagnostic testing and examination, and he came to some startling conclusions. In the foreword to the book Secret Life, written by David Jacobs in 1992, John Mack sort of summed up his view on the issue of alien abductions. He said this, the idea that men, women, and children can be taken against their wills from their homes, cars, and schoolyards by strange humanoid beings lifted onto spacecraft and subjected to intrusive and threatening procedures is so terrifying and yet so shattering to our notions of what is possible in our universe that the actuality of the phenomenon has been largely rejected out of hand or bizarrely distorted in most media accounts. This is altogether understandable given the disturbing nature of UFO abductions and our prevailing notions of reality. The fact remains, however, that for, over, that for 30 years and possibly longer, thousands of individuals who seem to be sincere and of sound mind and are seeking no personal benefit from their stories have been providing to those who will listen consistent reports of precisely such events. Now, John Mack has come to a number of conclusions in his studies. First of all, he's concluded that abductees are psychologically normal. They are not crazy, they are not psychotic, they are not delusional, they are normal. He states that abductees have no increased incidence of psychopathology than the general population, in fact, he said that they tend to be higher in intelligence intellectually than the general population. They have no increased incidence of temporal lobe epilepsy, which is a type of epilepsy that can cause uh, hallucinations, apparently. And they have no increased incidence of what he called hypnotizability, the ability to be hypnotized. The second thing he stated is that something definitely happened to these people. The people that he examined, he said they were so sincere and their emotion was so real and the stories were so profound that he felt that definitely some kind of an event actually happened to these people. Whether they were taken onto a craft or whether the experience that they had was something that was projected onto them by these aliens uh, and they imagined that they were on a craft, he said he didn't know. But something definitely happened to these people. Third, he said that the entities that have been doing the abducting, according to his study, are interdimensional entities, interdimensional beings, which is what we've been talking about. In other words, he says that the accounts that he's been able to study, the 
The people report, the people's reports about the nature of these entities fits not for physical beings from another planet, but beings from another dimension, from a parallel universe, from, from beyond our space-time domain. Now, John Mack is not a Christian, definitely not a Christian, but yet he comes to this conclusion after this examination. He also states that abductees are usually given prophetic messages about impending earth changes. Often these abductees are told telepathically or they're shown on some type of a screen about the impending cataclysmic earth changes that are coming to planet earth. We're talking book of revelation type stuff. And the people are led to believe that they are a messenger who's supposed to go back into the world and warn the earth about these coming catastrophes and that we must change our ways or the aliens are going to intervene because we're not capable of fixing the problems of our, ourselves. And his final conclusion about the alien abduction phenomenon is that the primary purpose of abduction, he claims, is to produce a race of half-alien, half-human beings. Now, let's talk about the abductee profile. A lot of people have tried to develop a profile of a typical abductee, and you can't really develop one. They seem to, become, they seem to come from all ages, all races, all socioeconomic uh, status, etc. But John Mack, in his book on page 5, stated this. He said, I have the impression that abductees as a group are usually open and intuitive individuals, less tolerant than, the us less tolerant than usual of societal authoritarianism and more flexible in accepting diversity and the unusual experiences of other people. Some of my case report some of my cases report a variety of psychic experiences which has been noted by other researchers. In fact, when you study the profiles that people have written about in the abduction phenomenon, you find usually that the person has been involved in some sort of occultic or neo-occultic activity, um, channeling, Ouija boards, astral projection, or if they're not involved in that, when they are contacted by these aliens, they allow the event to occur. That's one of the key things you need to keep in mind. Now, let's talk about a typical abduction. Again, you can't make any hard and fast rules here. We're just talking about some of the typical scenarios that you see. The first thing is, is that most abductions take place at night, and the person is usually, according to their accounts, taken from their house or their car. Almost universally, abductees report a period of missing time they may wake up on the side of the road in their car and notice that three or four hours have been lost. Or they may wake up in their bed and notice several hours have been lost that they cannot account for. Usually when I wake up in my bed and there's several hours unaccounted for, it's because I was sleeping. But, <clears throat> but that's what they report. <laughs> and I currently would like to get a few more unaccounted for hours tonight, actually. <laughs> Getting ready, this, ready for this conference has been... Pretty crazy. Another interesting thing that's been noticed is that during the time when someone claims they were abducted, researchers have noted that in the nearby region, in the nearby area, that UFO sightings have also been reported at the identical time that they claim to have been abducted. Also, John Mack told us in his book, Abduction, that many people who have been reported missing, or who have claimed an abduction event, have been reported missing for short periods of time by family or by friends. And almost universally, abductees are given some sort of a physical examination. That physical examination is uh, generally a much more unpleasant experience than the types of physical examinations I do in my office. They involve removal. They didn't tell you I'm a medical doctor. I'm a family practice doctor. I don't, I don't do these things that the aliens are doing. They usually, involve, they usually involve the removal of sperm or ova. They often involve putting implants, according to abductees, and often, very often, abductees claim that during the experience they were either impregnated or their genetic material was taken for the purpose of creating a race of hybrid, half-alien, half-human beings. Pretty disturbing stuff. Now, we have to let the skeptics speak, of course. 
Many, many people, including myself, are quite skeptical about the reality of alien abductions. Exactly what is it? I personally believe something is happening to these people, but uh, it may not be an actual physical abduction. We really don't know. The skeptics reply that the, the evidence is anecdotal, that simply we have just the reports of the individuals and no real physical evidence, which is point number two. They'll also claim that there are no eyewitnesses to abduction events. Bud Hopkins wrote a book called Witness, though, recently where he believes, uh, he claims to have uh, about a half a, dozen, a half a dozen witnesses to an abduction event which occurred in the Brooklyn Bridge, near the Brooklyn Bridge uh, in 1989. The, it's not that simple, though, because Hopkins' book, this uh, book Witnessed, um, turns out that uh, many people believe, including uh, Chuck and I, that Hopkins may be the victim of a gigantic disinformation campaign and the thing may have actually been orchestrated by disinformation specialists to, to uh, um, discredit Hopkins. But again, the skeptics state that uh, there are generally no witnesses. They also point out the unreliability of hypnotic regression. I didn't mention to you this, but most people that have had abductions, the information of the abduction is gotten from is, is obtained during uh, hypnotic, reg uh, hypnotic regression. It turns out, though, that both John Mack and Hopkins and other researchers state that at least all or some of an abduction event is recalled spontaneously without the assistance of, of uh, hypnotic, reg uh, hypnotic regression in about one-third of individuals. And, of course, that's their response to this object objection. They also state that what you see in the abduction phenomenon, the skeptic state, it's simply an example of hysterical contagion. And hysterical contagion is a psychological term which means that once an event occurs that is so shocking and so terrible that other people who are psychologically unstable begin to either in their dreams or hallucinate, begin to imagine that the event has occurred to them as well. Of course, John Mack reports and others, uh, there's a university in Canada that did a study of contactees and abductees. By the way, the difference between a contactee and an abductee, um, someone said, is that a contactee had a favorable experience when they were on board. Abductees had a bad time, contactees had a good time. <laughs> That's the difference. I, re I read that in uh, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind. <laughs> Um, where was I? Hysterical contagion, yeah. Um, the next one is post-traumatic stress syndrome. Post-traumatic stress syndrome is a syndrome which occurs in people that have experienced tremendously stressful events, such as uh, abuse as a child, sexual abuse, physical abuse as a child, that people often um, have terrible nightmares. Um, uh, of, of course, um, you know, uh, people that have been involved in war, Vietnam veterans, it was recognized many Vietnam vets have post-traumatic stress syndrome. And of course, this is a, a phenomenon where the person will have uh, nightmares, um, hallucinations, and terrible psychological trauma as a result of a previous trauma in their life. And finally, temporal lobe epilepsy, which I had mentioned before is a form of epilepsy. This is the things that skeptics will, will appeal to to state that the abduction phenomenon is not real. Well, John Mack, in turn says, okay, here's the challenge. Give me an explanation that will encompass the following, that will explain the following points. He says that any explanation other than abduction must explain the following points. Number one, the high degree of consistency of, the, uh, of detailed abduction accounts reported with emotion appropriate to actual experiences told by apparently re reliable observers. Number two, the absence of psychiatric illness or other apparent psychological or emotional factors that could account for what is being reported. Number three, the physical changes and lesions affecting the bodies of experiencers, which follow no evident psychodynamic pattern. Number four, the association of UFOs witnessed independently by others while abductions are taking place, which the abductee may not see. And number five, the reports of abduction in children as young as two or three years of age. Mac says any explanation other than abduction has got to explain those following five points. Now, Bud Hopkins, who 
was here this week in Roswell, wrote a book called Witness, as I mentioned, in 1996. And on page 378, he gives his bottom line for the nature of the UFO abduction phenomenon. He says, everything I have learned in 20 years of research into the UFO abductions, the UFO abduction phenomenon, leads me to conclude that the alien's central purpose is not to teach us about taking better care of the environment. Instead, all of the evidence points to their being here to carry out a complex breeding experiment in which they seem to be working to create hybrid species, a mix of human and alien characteristics. John Mack, in his book, Abduction, 1995, on page 414, said this, my own impression is that we may be witnessing something far more complex, namely an awkward joining of two species, engineered by an intelligence we are unable to fathom for a purpose that serves both of our goals with difficulties for each. I base this view on the evidence presented by the abductees themselves. And then John Mack says to, this, to the skeptics and to his detractors, in the MIT abduction conference, which was held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1992, he said, if what these abductees are saying is happening to them isn't happening, what is? Now, we'll talk more about the abduction phenomenon later. Now let's talk about the message that people have been given by these alien entities. I mentioned to you that many people have had contact, both channeling, automatic writing, face-to-face -face contact, etc. And the aliens have gone to a tremendous amount of effort to tell us what they think about the world, the universe, about our own religions, about the person of Jesus Christ, and about the origin of man, our purpose, and our destiny. They claim, through these various contact processes, that first of all, that they are our creators. That millions of years ago, perhaps billions of years ago, they engineered DNA and created the first life forms on planet Earth. And, they, they assist, and that they assisted through time in the evolution of mankind. In effect, we are somebody's biology experiment. I wonder if they consider the experiment a success. What do you think? <laughs> Some claim that there was an ape-like creature, that, man, that the earth had evolved up to the point where there were ape-like creatures and that the aliens got impatient and they genetically altered the DNA of an ape to make it into Homo sapiens. So step one, point one, they claim that they are our creators. Many channelers and other people that have gotten messages from these ETs claim that we, through a process of evolution, can evolve into gods like them. They also claim that we can evolve into Christhood. We can evolve from Homo sapiens to Homo Christus and have our own deity and our own Christhood. And that we only need to shed the old belief systems and allow ourselves to evolve to the next level, and that we can become like gods. I, didn't Satan say something like that to Eve in the Garden of Eden? I don't know, I, just, I can't remember. <laughs> they claim that Jesus and Buddha and Mohammed and Krishna, all the leaders of the great religions of the earth, were fathered by ETs. That what happened was that an extraterrestrial put Mary into a deep sleep and impregnated Mary, and when she woke up, she was pregnant with the baby Jesus, who was a half ET, half human light worker. They claim that in each epoch, each period of man's history, that the ETs have intervened and sent light workers or teachers or avatars like Christ, like Buddha, and like Muhammad, who have come into the world for the purpose of enlightening mankind and giving us successive revelation about our origin, our purpose, and our ultimate destiny here on planet Earth, and that they are directly responsible for the origin of these various religions. Through their channelers, the ETs promote the notion that the Earth is a living entity and that Mother Earth is to be worshipped, which is also the beliefs of shamans 
which is a form of witchcraft. And we're told by these ETs that we need to unite into a global governmental and religious system. And if we do not unite into a one world government and a one world religion, we are doomed. And that they are here to help their little biology experiment along to this next stage of our evolution. Many people have also been told by these ETs that there's no such thing as sin. There's no need for salvation and no need for redemption. And overall, the message from these alien entities contradicts the biblical worldview. Name a biblical doctrine and I can show you an alien message given through one of these contactees that contradicts the biblical message all the way from the creation, the fall, the flood, the origin of Christ, the message of Christ, the destiny of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, all the second coming of Christ, as you'll see, all denied by these so-called alien entities. The first message that we're told, as I mentioned, is that the aliens are our creators. Well, it turns out that the notion that we are from an extraterrestrial source has been given a boost by actual scientists in recent decades. In the late 1970s and early 80s, two gentlemen, Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the DNA molecule, and Sir Fred Hoyle, who is an astronomer and mathematician who was knighted by the Queen of England for his work, they set out to determine the mathematical probability of the origin of life by chance the notion that Darwin uh, had promoted that life arose by chance. And they got to work on their computers and their, used their graduate students and their, sur their supercomputers and came to the conclusion that life is so complex that it could not have arisen by chance on planet Earth because it's too complex. And the conditions on planet Earth were not favorable to allow life to arise by chance. So you'd think, well, they would say then, okay, then God made life on Earth, right? No. They said that we are the product of not intelligent design by God, but that aliens flew over planet Earth three billion years ago and sprinkled amoebas into the ocean. And those little single-celled organisms, which were sent here by the aliens, have evolved gradually and slowly over history into this marvelous specimen you see before you and these marvelous specimens out here. And that we are their biology experiment, right? They called the process directed panspermia. That's a real scientific sounding name, doesn't it? Directed panspermia. I read an article recently by a Russian scientist that said that he thought that what happened was that an alien spaceship was flying near our solar system and they purged their garbage from their, uh, their the, the, the stool and the urine and their garbage from their ship and some of it landed in our ocean and that we evolved from alien garbage. Interesting concept, huh? That was in the, that made the newspapers about six months ago. It was all over the, the uh, international press. And in 1996, when NASA reported that they believed that they'd found evidence of life, microscopic life from Mars, one of the scientists suggested that maybe planet Earth was seeded, that life arose first on Mars, and that maybe we're actually Martians. And as I've mentioned, many contactees report that the aliens claim to be our creators. Michael Denton, a man who um, wrote a book in 1986 called Evolution, A Theory, and Crisis, on page 250, talked about the complexity of life. He said this. He said, although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, weighing less than 10 to the minus 12 grams, each is in, its, in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. He says that the simplest amoeba, we're talking pond scum, is more complex than a Cray supercomputer or the space shuttle. So when you walk out here today and you <coughs> step on that bug on the sidewalk, you've just squished something far more complex than a space shuttle. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so he says that life is incredibly complex, far more complex than anything ever made by man. Regarding the notion of directed panspermia, he said nothing illustrates more clearly just how intractable a problem the origin of life has become than the fact that world authorities can seriously toy with the idea of panspermia. 
page 271 of his book. Now, Michael Behay, who wrote a book in 1996 called Darwin's Black Box, discussed the issue of the origin of life and the origin of complexity, and he said this about Francis Crick's and Fred Hoyle's idea. He said, the interesting part of Crick's idea is the role of the aliens, whom he has speculated sent space bacteria to Earth. This scenario still leaves open the question of who designed the designer, the aliens? How did life originate originally? Well, they'll say, well, see, the aliens that sprinkled us and made our Earth, they were sprinkled by a previous population. Well, well who made them? Well, a previous population to them flew over that and sprinkled them. Well, who made them? Well, a previous population prior to them had sprinkled them. And so you have this infinite regression back in time of aliens flying around the universe, sprinkling amoeba or dropping their trash accidentally on planets, and that gives rise to planet Earth. I mean, it gives, lives to, gives rise to life in the universe. Well, the problem is we've got a finite universe, as Chuck mentioned. Space and time and matter had a beginning, so you cannot have an infinite regression back in time. So the origin of life in the universe, ultimately, which had to be from an intelligent source, must have been an extra-dimensional source, a source beyond our space-time domain. And that's exactly where the Bible says that God is. He inhabits eternity. I want to introduce you to the teaching of a man named Rael, the Raelian movement. Rael was born in 1945, I'm sorry, 46, on September 30th. He was born with the name Claude Vorilhan. His mother was a French citizen, Marie Vorilhan, who he claims was selected by extraterrestrials and inseminated on them, inseminated by them on December 25th, 1945. Rail claims that he is the offspring of an alien and a human. He's a half ET, half human. He claims that on December 13th, 1973, that he was contacted by the ETs and told the story of his origin, the story of man's origin. And he was told that indeed the creators of mankind are super, super highly evolved extraterrestrials, which call themselves the Elohim. In the International Realian Movement's official webpage, I took this off of their webpage, www.absurdity.com, in August 1996, <laughs> we read the beliefs of the Realian Movement about the origin of mankind. The messages dictated to Rael, by the way, Rael was the name that the aliens gave him. They renamed him from Claude Vorilhan to, they gave him the name Rael which happens to be the name Ra, the sun god, and the name El, the name of God in the Bible. I just noticed that. I don't know if that's what it is. But <laughs> the messages, according to their webpage, the messages dictated to Rail explain how life on earth is not the result of random evolution nor the work of a supernatural god. It is a deliberate creation using DNA by a scientifically advanced people who made human beings literally in their image. We were the ones who made all life on earth. You mistook us for gods. We were at the origin of your main religions. Now that you are mature enough to understand this, we would like to enter official contact through an embassy. Guess where they want to put the embassy? Israel. References to these, these scientists and their work, as well as to their symbol of infinity, can be found in the ancient texts of many cultures. For example, in Genesis, the biblical account of creation, the word Elohim has been mistranslated as God in the singular, but it is plural, which means those who came from the sky. So their view is that the Bible, which says in the beginning God, Elohim, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, it's a mistranslation, that actually we are the creation of the Elohim, which is a plurality of extraterrestrial beings who made mankind literally in their image. They claim in the book, The Message Given to Rail by Extraterrestrials, in book one, all the great prophets, including Buddha and Moses and Jesus and Mohammed, were messengers of these extraterrestrials. Jesus was born from the union of one of these extraterrestrials and a daughter of man. And his task was to spread the biblical messages in anticipation of the age of apocalypse. The Realian movement recognizes most other religions because it was our creators, the Elohim, who started them. 
It was they who initiated the prophets whose role was to progressively educate and, and guide humanity. Regarding Genesis chapter 6, which Chuck has already spoken extensively on, Rail wrote this, When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of Elohim saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. They took them, they took them as wives of all they had chosen. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. And he comments on this. He says, The creators, the Elohim, living in exile, took the most beautiful daughters of humanity and made them their wives. So the Bible, te which teaches that fallen angels came, Satan's minions who came and did this activity in Genesis 6, the Realian movement says, no, 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 no. It wasn't angels. It was extraterrestrials. So he's made the connection for us right there. We also have the writings and the teachings of a group of aliens called the Pleiadians. The Pleiadians, we are told, are a group of uh, highly evolved Nordic type uh, aliens who are from the star system of the Pleiades. Barbara Marciniak, in her book, Earth Pleiadian Keys to the Living Library, written in 1995, on page 78 and 80, says this of these Pleiadian extraterrestrials. Actually, these are the extraterrestrials speaking through Barbara Marciniak, who is a channeler. Where have you come from? Who are your creator parents? Who conceived of you, then made you? The Sumerians understood the visitors from the stars, who for hundreds of thousands of years influenced and played with experiments of life on each, continents, each continent. The gods watched and participated with their creations on earth. Ancient myths and legends, hundreds of thousands of years old, tell of the serpents, dragons, and reptilian visitors from the skies. The reptilian race, or lizzies, as we affectionately call them, are an integral part of your ancestral line. Understand that the, rep, re, the reptilian energies, these are a form of reptilian aliens, aliens that look like the reptilians, are creator gods. They were some of the prime instigators in the putting together the human species on planet Earth. Barbara Marciniak, channeling aliens, from the Pleiades in her book, Earth Pleiadian Keys to the Living Library, 1995, page 78 and 80. So instead of a transcendent creator beyond time and space being our creator, it was reptilian aliens who created and designed planet Earth with the assistance of other aliens and that we are the product of their teaching, of their creation. Another alien by the name of Theodore is channeled by Gina Lake. Gina Lake wrote a book, Extraterrestrial Vision, in 1993, and on page 13, she said this. Actually, the alien Theodore, speaking through her, said this. Human beings did not evolve naturally on Earth. They evolved from genetic engineering of ape-like primates by beings visiting your Earth millions of years ago. That extraterrestrial, I should say, that the notion that extraterrestrials altered the DNA of certain primates on Earth to create human species is undoubtedly shocking. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and yet, your scientists are beginning to play with the same technology, like father, like son, Theodore tells us. In another book called New World Order by channeler Timothy Green Beckley, written in 1990 on page 141, the alien channel tells us this. Jesus rules over this planet, Earth. He has tried for the last 2,000 years to lift you up out of the muck and mire humankind has gotten itself into. Jesus does not wish to be worshipped. He, he wishes but to teach. He wishes to share his knowledge of the kingdom of God with those who will listen. Brad Steiger in his book, The Fellowship, on page 156 and 157, wrote in 1988, speaking of Jesus, he said, generally speaking, the space being's teachings Generally being, in the space being's teachings, Jesus of Nazareth is not God, but is a Christ, an ascended master who incarnated so that he might demonstrate the Christ pattern for all humans to achieve in a, in, in a like manner. Between the ages of 12 and 30, according to these sources, he was receiving special training aboard a spacecraft or in a remote area of Earth selected by these space entities. Whoa. I wonder what chapter of Matthew that's in. 
Now let's talk about the religions of the extraterrestrials. I mentioned to you earlier that the aliens promote the notion that Earth is a living being, that the Earth is a living entity that is worthy of worship. Of course, many ancients on Earth, many ancient civilizations worshiped Mother Earth, and today, Native American shaman worship Mother Earth as a living spiritual entity made of body and soul. The body being the physical matter and the soul being the uh, goddess Gaia, the, the female goddess Gaia. And of course, the New Age movement today worships and promotes the notion of earth worship. In 1979, James Lovelock and other scientists gave a boost to the notion of earth worship and earth being a living organism when they seriously proposed that the earth is a living being which has been directing the evolution of its inhabitants. They called this the Gaia hypothesis after the Greek female goddess of the earth, Gaia. And the result, of course, was a boost to those religions and groups that worship Mother Earth. Now, the Bible tells us that in the end times, that there's going to come a tremendous deception, a tremendous delusion. In Romans chapter 1, verse 25, we're told that those who will not worship the true and the living God, that they who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So one of the effects of the coming deception, we'll talk about this more tonight, is going to be that people will be encouraged to worship creation rather than the true and the living God. And worshiping indeed the earth is indeed worshiping the creation. David Spangler, who is a New Age author, regularly, he claims, channels extraterrestrial entities. And in his book, Reflections on the Christ, in 1981, page 45, he said this of Lucifer. Of course, Lucifer is the anointed cherub that covereth, who fell. He was the highest of God's creation, his angelic creation, and he fell into sin when he became prideful. And we call him devil and, the, and Satan and the destroyer, etc. The Bible, of course, you know, Lucifer's the, the bad guy, right? Well, not according to David Spangler. David Spangler says that Lucifer comes to give, us the to give to us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, then he is free and we are free. That is the Luciferic initiation. It is, one that many people, it is one that many people now and in the days ahead will be facing, for it, is an for it is an initiation into the new age. So that if we as people want to go into the next step of our evolution, to become more spiritual beings, to become more one with the universe, more at one with the harmony of Mother Earth and the universe, we need to be initiated into Lucifer. And he got this information from extraterrestrials. Are you beginning to suspect that maybe these guys are not our friends? <laughs> Brad Steiger in his book, The Fellowship, on page 62, wrote this. The space beings seem very concerned with the spreading of what has come to be known as New Age concepts. Fresh methods of looking at metaphysics, universal laws, brotherhood, and even health and hygiene. The space beings appear definitely concerned with seeing that all humankind is united as one on this planet. Contactees have been told that these space beings hope to guide Earth to a period of great unification. The space beings also seek to bring about a single, solidified government which will conduct itself on spiritual principles and permit all of its citizens to grow constructively in love. So in other words, the ETs want to bring about a one-world government and a one-world ecumenical religion. What a concept. Hmm? Where have we heard about that before? Now, the Bible teaches that Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, the very creator of the universe, incarnated as a man, lived the perfect life, was crucified on a Roman cross, died for our sins, he resurrected from the dead, and that Jesus ascended into heaven, not by an alien beam ship, and that he will come again in the future, the second coming of Christ. Well, Timothy Green Beckley gives us the alien New Age view of the coming of Christ, the second coming. In his book, The New World Order, on page uh, 141, written in 1990, he says this, 
Jesus was taken up into heaven. He was levitated by a spaceship under our command. He will be brought back in a similar fashion. The man you call Jesus of Nazareth has the most powerful aura of anyone born on your planet. He was truly holy. He was truly wise. And yet, many of your people refuse to acknowledge him. There have been other wise men, but not of such a high caliber. Jesus shall return to your planet in the not-too-distant future. He is waiting and biding time for his return. Just as your holy book, the Bible says, everyone will see him descend from the sky. He will come surrounded by a fleet of glittering spaceships, objects which you call UFOs. Cool. Which verse and chapter is that? I must have missed it. Timothy Green Beckley channeled by the Ashtar Command. This is the Ashtar Command, a group of alien entities who channel through Timothy Green Beckley. Actually, he's the editor of the book. It was channeled through other people, the book New World Order in 1990. Now, the Bible says that in the last days, in 1 Timothy 4.1, that there's going to be a tremendous deception that's going to come and that people will actually give heed to, interact with, demonic spirits in the end times. First, First Timothy chapter one, or chapter four, verse one. Now the spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The word giving heed to there is a Greek word which implies literally to interface with, interact with, to uh, physically be involved with and, may, and possibly even to worship them. So in the last days, physical entities, demonic spirits, satanic entities are going to come to planet Earth feigning benevolence and brotherhood and love for mankind and are going to interface with us. And what are they going to do? Doctrines of demons. They're going to tell us that, well, your Bible got it all wrong. You see, we were your creators and you got it all wrong about Jesus, too. He wasn't a son of God. He was a half alien, half human. And they're going to Straighten us all out, because we got all messed up over the last 2,000 years, you see. And they're going to tell us the truth. Well, the Bible says that that's doctrines of demons. And I believe that's where we're at today. The UFO phenomenon and its associated alleged alien entities is a phenomenon which is accelerating in our time. It is an interdimensional phenomenon with interdimensional entities who bring with them a message of correction to planet Earth, that we got it all wrong. And they're going to come shortly, they claim, usher in a new age of awakening, awakening and enlightenment and help us to understand the truth of our origin, our mission, and our destiny on planet Earth. And this, they state, is going to happen once the malcontents, the people that are standing in the way of the arrival, are taken out of the way. And we will talk about that in our next session.